Good morning, I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman. Here are the top five things to know this Wednesday. Number one, the impeachment showdown in Washington. President Trump now comparing it to a coup. The State Department's Inspector General is heading to Capitol Hill today after requesting an urgent briefing in the Ukraine scandal. Meanwhile, House Democrats say Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has a conflict of interest in the impeachment investigation, so they're now communicating with his deputy. Number two, new details about President Trump's effort to block Central American migrants from entering the country. When the president threatened to close the the southern border back in March. He reportedly told his advisors that he wanted a border wall fortified with a moat stocked with snakes or alligators, which prompted his aides to investigate what that would cost. Officials tell the New York Times after publicly suggesting that soldiers shoot migrants if they threw rocks, the president backed off, but later suggested that they shoot migrants in the legs to slow them down. His staff told him that would be illegal. On to number three, former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger faces between five and 99 years in prison for murdering her neighbor, Botham John. The sentencing phase of Geiger's trial resumes today. She says she entered the wrong apartment and thought John was an intruder. The jury chose to convict her of murder instead of a lesser charge. And now that the sentencing hearing has begun, prosecutors have released text messages from Geiger, which they describe as racist and violent. Geiger's attorneys will present witnesses today as they try to get her the shortest sentence possible. Number four, North Korea has test-fired another ballistic missile just hours after agreeing to resume nuclear talks with the U.S. This time, officials say the missile may have been launched from a submarine, suggesting Kim Jong-un is expanding his military capabilities with weapons that are harder to detect. Japan believes at least one missile landed in Japanese waters. And finally, number five, pregnant women near Minneapolis are hoping to get more than a good meal at one local restaurant. Moms-to-be are heading to the Suburban restaurant for what's called the Labor Inducer Burger. It's Angus beef, honey-cured bacon, peach caramelized onions, and spicy mustard on a pretzel bun. So at least two women say they went into labor within seven hours after eating that good-looking, yummy, delicious, and sure tastes Whoa. so good burger. That is a burger burger. All right, so that brings us to our question of the day. Have you done anything out of the ordinary to induce labor? Or have, has your wife or girlfriend? Yeah, that question is for the men, too. What have you done? Uh, I'm, I'm just there for support. Okay. That Get that sense. baby out of there! But if I knew a burger would do the trick... You'd get all the burgers. I get all the burgers for me, the mothers. <coughs> Tell us in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. Let's get to the big story now. A new twist in the explosive impeachment battle in Washington. The State Department's independent watchdog is heading to Capitol Hill today for what's being called an urgent <coughs> briefing on the Ukraine scandal. Meanwhile, House Democrats are now trying to bypass Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as they face off over impeachment witnesses. They're suggesting Pompeo has a conflict of interest. ABC Serena Marshall has the new details from Washington. Serena, good morning. Kenneth Janae, good morning to both of you. And that back and forth between Democrats and the State Department comes as the president ramps up his attacks on the impeachment inquiry, now calling it an attempted coup on his presidency. One week into the impeachment fight, the battle between the executive and legislative branches on full display. In Italy... Mr. Secretary, do you have any comment on reports you're on the July 25th call with President Zelensky? Secretary of State Mike Pompeo not answering questions. But back home, trading written threats with Democrats, responding to their request for confidential interviews with State Department employees as an act of intimidation intended to bully and treat improperly those employees. Democrats firing back, not to Pompeo, but his number two, writing, Secretary Pompeo now appears to have an obvious conflict of interest after new revelations that Pompeo was on that call between President Trump and the president of Ukraine threatening to withhold his salary and saying he was the one trying to intimidate witnesses or prevent them from talking with Congress. He basically wants to put the State Department in lockdown. But the State Department's independent watchdog now set to give an urgent briefing to lawmakers today. Sources telling ABC News the highly unusual meeting is related to the department and Ukraine. President Trump, meanwhile, continuing his defense via Twitter, writing he's come to the conclusion that what is taking place is not an impeachment, it is a coup, and still trying to unmask the whistleblower. But the Senate's most senior Republican not having it. Senator Chuck Grassley rebuking the president, writing in a statement the whistleblower ought to be heard out and protected. 
Despite the objections from Pompeo, at least one of those five State Department employees will be heading to Capitol Hill. Kurt Volker, the former envoy to Ukraine, confirming he will show up for his deposition scheduled for Thursday. Janae Kenneth. All right, Serena, and before you go, question for you. The president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, is placing responsibility on the State Department, and he has now hired a lawyer. So will he testify is the question. Uh, Kenneth, that's still a big question as to whether or not he will testify, but he did hire a lawyer, a former Watergate lawyer by the name of John Sale, and, and hiring that lawyer, remember, it comes after the Democrats on Capitol Hill issued multiple subpoenas from three different committees for Giuliani to testify, specifically around his conversations that the whistleblower said he was having with officials in Ukraine. Now, that whistleblower also saying that the State Department employees were trying to, quote, contain the damage from those conversations and uh, take a listen here to what Giuliani said what he was doing at the behest of the State Department. I have uncovered corruption that this Washington swamp has been covering up effectively for years and his State Department you know asked me to do this. Oh I don't know I'm, I'm weighing the alternatives I'm I'll kind of like go through it I'll get all my evidence together I'll get my charts I don't know if they let me uh, use videotapes and tape recordings that I have. Now, John Sale, when reached by phone by CNN, said he's still gathering all the evidence and that what I've already learned is this is very complex. But remember, just a couple of days ago, Giuliani on ABC sent some mixed messages on whether or not he will testify, citing attorney-client privilege. He is the president's personal lawyer, but there are questions there on if he was going to Ukraine and speaking to Ukrainian officials at the behest of the State Department. Does that client-attorney privilege count? So Kenneth Janae. Not sure if that privilege will hold up. Serena, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And moving on, there's new evidence against a former Dallas police officer who is now a convicted killer. A juror has found Amber Geiger guilty of murdering her neighbor. Geiger claimed she'd entered the wrong apartment by accident and shot both them, John, thinking he was an intruder. Now, as jurors consider Geiger's punishment, prosecutors have revealed what they say are racist and violent text messages, including one where Geiger jokes about the death of Martin Luther King Jr. At Harding University overnight. A remembrance for Botham John, who was well known at his alma mater years after his graduation. He came through this school and left an impression on the hearts of everybody here. Former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger shot and killed John in his own apartment in September 2018. On Tuesday, a jury found her guilty of murder. Throughout her trial, Geiger insisted she walked into John's apartment by mistake, thinking it was her home and believing he was an intruder, then opening fire. It took the jury less than five hours to reach a verdict. This ruling will now say that you are safe to be in your homes and people can no longer just say, I made a mistake and took your life. The jury, made up of men and women of different ethnicities, had the choice of murder, manslaughter, or acquittal. I wish he was the one that the gun killed me. Throughout the trial, prosecutors tried to point out contradictions in Geiger's behavior, beginning with why she went into the apartment, despite hearing noise inside. You could have called for help on your radio, and you could have had the cavalry there in two minutes. I could have. You could have had SWAT mobilized. It, they could have. And had you done any one of those things, Mr. Jean would probably be alive today. Right? Yes, sir. Defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer says that was a telling moment. When we look at the verdict that was given, murder, not manslaughter, it's obvious that the jury here believed that in opening the door, pushing forward, and knowing that there were sounds somewhere inside, that her actions inside that home were intentional and not reckless. Therefore, that was murder. On police body cameras, several officers immediately started CPR to try and save John, something prosecutors say Geiger failed to do. Did you properly perform CPR on Mr. John? No, I did not. And now, as the sentencing phase of the trial begins, prosecutors have been given permission to show jurors racially charged text messages linked to Geiger. One exchange came during the city's Martin Luther King Jr. parade. Someone texts Geiger, when does this end, LOL? She replied, when MLK is dead, oh wait. In another exchange, two days before the shooting, someone texts Geiger asking if she wanted a dog. Do you know what you need? A German Shepherd? I happen to have one for you, although she may be racist. Geiger replied, it's okay, I'm the same. Prosecutors also showed jurors three posts from Pinterest. One image saved by Geiger shows a military sniper with overlaid text that reads, stay low, go fast, kill first, die last, 
One shot, one kill, no luck, all skill. Geiger's defense team is expected to call witnesses as the sentencing hearing resumes today. She could face anywhere from five to 99 years in prison. A judge's decision in a lawsuit against Harvard University is being seen as a major victory for supporters of affirmative action in college admissions. The judge ruled that Harvard's admissions process does not discriminate against Asian Americans by holding them to a higher standard than students of other races. The group that filed the lawsuit is planning to appeal the ruling, and the case could end up at the Supreme Court. The chief negotiator for striking auto workers says the union and General Motors remain far apart. He said GM made what he calls a comprehensive proposal Monday night, but it, quote, came up short. Instead, the UAW made a counterproposal. This is the 17th day of the strike. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is worried about the 2020 presidential election. In a leaked audio recording, he blasts his critics, including Senator Elizabeth Warren, who has said she would break up big tech companies like Facebook if elected. Zuckerberg said he's prepared to sue the government if it tries to break up his company. A massive iceberg is making big news in the science world. Researchers say the 600 square mile chunk broke away from an ice shelf in East Antarctica. The size means it's larger than the city of Los Angeles. Scientists say they don't think the break is related to climate change, but rather a natural event that happens every six or seven decades. And check this out, a terrifying moment for a driver in Oregon. Wait for it right there. A piece of plastic flew up, got stuck to his windshield. Could you imagine? Fortunately, he was able to slow down in the median and remove the plastic, mm. but not before some very, very scary seconds there on the road. Well, coming up, the young man whose talent and sheer passion is turning him into a superstar. But first, will drones be delivering packages to your doorstep in the near future? Find out after this. Welcome back. UPS is a step closer to having a nationwide fleet of drones. The federal government has removed a number of restrictions on the company's program. The move also gives UPS a jump on one of its biggest delivery rivals. Here's ABC's Brad Milkey. Hey, that's right. We've been talking about drone delivery for, what, five years now? That is when Amazon first promised it. But now the federal government has given the green light on drone delivery, not to Amazon, but to UPS. For years, UPS has been getting its own drone program off the ground. One of their main test projects has been ferrying around medical supplies, blood samples, specimens between hospitals that need them quickly. Well, the FAA now says it's a test run no longer. I spoke to ABC senior transportation correspondent David Curley, and he said the FAA actually gave several green lights to UPS here. What they've been given in this initial approval from the government is that they will not have to do line of sight. That means that the operator doesn't have to be able to see the drone, so they can fly farther than you can see that drone. Oh, and that's the first time we've seen that, then? It, it is the first time it's been approved, fully approved, uh, to have non-line of sight operation. Also, drones and packages more than 55 pounds, they can fly at night as well. So a lot of the restrictions that have been on drone operators have been lifted for UPS in this use currently approved by the government. Now, this will start in North Carolina, and eventually UPS hopes to roll it out to 20 different hospitals and perhaps different kinds of deliveries. And David said this was a day that might have just changed how things are delivered in this country forever. We'll have a lot more on Start Here later this morning. Listen on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. Janae, Kenneth? Thank you, Brad. Now to North Korea, where a ballistic missile has been fired shortly after the nation announced plans to restart nuclear talks with the U.S. Let's go across the pond to Julia McFarlane in the London Bureau for the latest. Julia, good morning. So good morning, what do Kenneth. we know about this most recent launch? So what we know is that this was a submarine launched ballistic missile. Uh, it flew for around 280 miles before it then landed uh, in the Sea of Japan, where most missiles uh, uh, tend to end up these days. This is the 11th missile launch uh, that the North Koreans have fired this year. Uh, remember, of course, that peace talks with the U.S., uh, they've been stalled uh, since that summit in Hanoi, Vietnam, uh, back in February, when the two sides failed to agree any uh, further steps on denuclearization and the lifting of sanctions. Um, but what we know is that a few hours before this latest launch uh, was that Pyongyang said that it would be ready to finally restart those talks again, uh, possibly even later this week. So a lot of analysts are saying that this, uh, uh, this show of force is just uh, the North Koreans trying to reassert themselves, give themselves maybe a stronger position by signaling to the U.S., hey, this is serious, we mean business, look at what's on 
on stake. You really need to give some way on those sanctions lifted, uh, which is, of course, what North Korea wants. And the U.S. position has always been that it needs to see real steps of dis uh, denuclearization before it will agree to start lifting sanctions on the North Koreans. And Julie, meanwhile in Hong Kong, the police chief is calling yesterday one of the city's most violent and chaotic. A police officer actually shot a protester in the chest at point blank range during a protest. So what do we know about the protester in his condition this morning? Exactly. A lot of footage uh, circulated yesterday of that moment. It was a young protester. He was initially described as a schoolboy. He's an 18-year-old boy. Uh, and he was seen uh, attacking a police officer with a pole who then discharged his weapon, uh, hitting him in the, uh, with a bullet square in the chest. Now, it was not the first time that live rounds uh, had been fired in Hong Kong, but it was the first time that a protester had been hit. The police chief said that the officer was justified in his uh, in his use of force because he believed that his life was in danger. The government says uh, that the boy, he's called Sang Chi Kin, um, he uh, is in a stable position, the government says. Um, in total yesterday, around 104 people were taken to the hospital, 180 people were arrested, and 25 officers had been injured. Uh, a lot of people describing yesterday's scenes as the most violent uh, in Hong Kong in these last four months of protests, coming, of course, on that China National Day, which the Hong Kongers, uh, at least those who were protesting against the government, they wanted to make it clear that it was a day of mourning for them. Yeah, really overshadowing the 70th uh, anniversary there of China celebrating um, communist rule. Also exactly. in the Netherlands, there was a bizarre showing from Dutch farmers who are protesting claims they are responsible for emissions contributing to climate change, and apparently they cause a headache for commuters. Yeah. Uh Hundreds and hundreds of miles, uh, 2,000 farmers uh, taking part in this protest, uh, causing log jams across some 700 miles across the Netherlands. Now, this all started this protest in a field outside The Hague. Um, and you're exactly right. The farmers are basically saying uh, that they are being singled out, victimized. Uh, that's following calls for uh, inefficient cattle farms to be shut down and some speed limits lowered uh, in order to combat pollution. Um, now, a lot of the farmers, they were, uh, as well as taking to the streets and their tractors, they were holding up signs and banners saying, no farmers, no food, you love meat, bread and fries. Without farmers, you wouldn't have them at all. Uh, they are saying that other um, industries, such as the aviation industry, need uh, to also take some blame and shoulder uh, some of the responsibility for pollution, that it's not just them. But it caused absolute havoc yesterday, um, you know, and it hit during the rush hour on Tuesday. Day. So the whole country uh, was was uh, was hearing about this, and a large amount a large amount of people trying to get to work uh, were stuck in those log jams. Right, that climate change debate really seen around the world. Julie McFarlane, thank you so much. We appreciate it. See ya. All right, let's get a check for our notifications. Mm -hmm. Starting with a different take on a beloved fast food mascot. Yep. Look at this. Ooh, is that Ronald? Why can we see Ronald McDonald's chest? Or is that Ronald's cousin, Donnie? I don't know. Is that, that Donnie? Donnie? Donnie McDonald? Donnie. Yeah, what did they call Marky Mark? I guess that doesn't work, but mm -mm. looks more like him. Um, so what, what, why are they doing this again? It was some street artist thing, and then they added it to a Japanese McDonald's And then people ad, started and tattooing onto their bodies. He's got fries coming out of his Speedo. That's just not the way we you eat fries. Hey, next up, the makers of the video game Halo have hired an expert voice actor, a pug, to make alien noises. Listen to him. That's Kenneth napping. That's you eating. <laughs> Sounds just like an alien. I hope that pug gets a lot of residuals there. Next to a little boy who gets up close and personal with a couple of bears at the zoo. Okay, look, he's checking them out. Look yep. at that. Those are some big old bears. Um, okay, so then the bears oh. start to play. All right, now wait for it. Wait for it. Ready? Playful bears. Whoa! Oh, oh nope. Mm. Too close for comfort Scared there. Him. And a Georgia woman's <laughs> trip to the gas station ended with a kick in the head. A deer went leaping past Linda Tennant as she filled up recently in Brunswick. One of its hooves caught her in the head. <laughs> Tennant is okay. She oh, said she dear. thought it was, she thought she was being robbed. <laughs> and as you said, 
Oh dear. Oh dear. Now to a heartwarming surprise for Layla Anderson, the 11 year old St. Louis Blues super fan who was the team's good luck charm last season. Layla, who battled a rare autoimmune disease that nearly took her life, was surprised by two Blues players with her very own Stanley Cup ring on wow. Tuesday. Layla broke down into tears and said the ring fits beautifully even though oh. it's about the same size as her hand. She's so excited. And this morning we're meeting a young percussionist who's managed to hop onto his own rising star. Dallin Johnson's rhythm and his passion for what he does drummed up enough excitement online that last night he was a guest on Jimmy Kimmel Live. He may be on the sidelines, but there's no doubt Dallin Johnston is the star of this show. I love all of it. I love performing. I just love the wonderful music and the looks and the meaning behind the music. And the internet loves Dallin right back. I never thought it would be like me who would like have like a viral video. The tweets of support coming in double time. This kid is a national treasure. We must protect him at all costs. This kid is my spirit animal, passion personified. We should all enjoy what we do that much. Dallin marching to the beat of his own drum all the way to Hollywood. Are you aware of the fact that you're the only good thing in America right now? I think your show is pretty good, too. Oh, well, thank you, Dallin. <laughs> the Gilbert, Arizona native appearing on Jimmy Kimmel Live last night. His newfound fame has been a long time coming. Whenever I'd sing or perform or play music, People would always notice me and I would feel so good about it and I enjoyed it. An affinity for the spotlight? Not surprising. But get this, Dallin only recently took up drumming. I am actually a trombone player, but in marching band I did percussion because it was something that fit me more because of the performance aspect. Proof that practice makes perfect, but passion makes a star. I always give everything and that's what I try to do every time to like give other people joy that I have. So he's got a lot of star quality. He is a megawatt musician and Dallin actually plans on engineering and studying engineering in college because he says he is passionate about that too. So much passion. Love that, that kid. kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Well, coming up, we have a busy Wednesday ahead. We'll tell you what events to watch out for. Plus a look behind the scenes at the glamorous work of reporters in the White House. We'll tell you what caused chaos in the briefing room after this. Here's what to watch out for today. The State Department's independent watchdog is poised to give an urgent briefing on Capitol Hill. Sources say the State Department's inspector general requested the highly unusual meeting with congressional staff about documents related to Ukraine, but details are unclear. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff has been invited to join House Speaker Nancy Pelosi for her weekly news conference at 1045 a.m. Eastern. And President Trump is set to welcome the President of Finland to the White House for meetings and a working lunch. The two leaders will hold a joint press conference at 2 Eastern, where Trump will likely be asked about the ongoing impeachment inquiry. You can watch those right here on ABC News Live. And Russian cosmonaut will hand over command of the International Space Station to European Space Agency astronaut Luka Parmitano before heading back to Earth. And about 700 massage therapists in Kiev, Ukraine, are attempting to set a world record for the most Massages being carried out simultaneously. They are trying to beat the previous record of 641 set in Thailand back in 2012. Plus, don't forget to tune into the debrief for an update on all our top stories and the briefing room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. Finally, to a commotion in the White House briefing room, and no, it wasn't due to an on-camera on press briefing. We haven't seen one of those in about seven months. Imagine that. But a mouse dropped out of a ceiling in the press area. It fell right into the lap of NBC News correspondent Peter Alexander before racing off through the briefing room. It set off what appears to have been an unsuccessful chase. The mouse has not been caught. Alexander tweeted in other news, a mouse literally fell out of the ceiling in our White House booth and landed on my lap. And our friend Karen Travers tweeted this picture with the comment, Team ABC is barricading ourselves in our booth next door. This seems secure, right? And Seven months since a press briefing? And I think they said they're not going to have any more. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie Grisham, White House Press Secretary, said, nah, we're done with those. That's it. <laughs> That's it from us, too. All right, have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow.